Science at Home. Uh, my name is Heather and I'm joined here with uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Connor. And uh, today we're going to be answering some of your uh, questions that you've been sending through on social media. So, uh, Connor, I hope you don't mind. I've sort of themed up our little chat here. Is that OK? That's great. Yes. That's yeah. Good. The theme is stars. Are you good with that? Brilliant. Yeah, I know we're sort of in a bit of a different setting here than we were the last time we were talking. I mean, we were in work the last time, so this is sort of new for both of us, isn't it? See how this goes, yeah. Yeah, so um, just the folks at home have been sending through their questions and I've written them all down. Um, and guys, if you have any questions throughout this conversation that we're having, please do send them in and we'll try and answer them um, in the comments section. Um, so the first question that was asked was asked by quite a number of people. It was, um, how many stars, Connor, can we see in the night sky? Well, that's that's quite a good question, actually. And and I suppose the the answer really is 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 it depends, which is not a very scientific answer, I know. But um, it, there, there's a lot of things which will affect how many stars you might see in the night sky. But first of all. Yeah, the window here. See, it's quite cloudy at the moment, so if it was night time right now, I wouldn't see very many stars. Yeah. But assume that we've got a nice clear night, um, and also that the, we don't have the moon, because the moon is quite bright, so that can hide some of the stars on us. Mm -hmm. We're out in, in the countryside where it's nice and dark, so you've not got light pollution, which will also affect the number of stars you'll see. You might see, I suppose, probably a few thousand stars in the sky, if you have very good eyesight. Yeah, and I suppose like to everyone that might seem like a lot, but really when you think about the Milky Way as a whole, there's so many, so much more stars than that. Um, and am I right in saying this is just me spitballing now? Like are most of the stars we see that we can see with our naked eye, they're not just single stars. Some of them are like multiple star systems, isn't that right? They can be a lot of the stars, yes. What we see is, is um, because they're quite far away, they just look like tiny points of light to us. Um, at least with our eyes. If you use a telescope, you might be able to see that some of those stars are actually made up of multiple stars in, in, in systems that are um, a bit more complicated than just a single star. That is that is true. And what we also know is with all of the space telescopes and things we've done, especially the Gaia Space Telescope recently, which has done a huge survey of the, the entire Milky Way, or at least all the stars it can see in the Milky Way, and it's found, I think, well over a billion stars in, our gal in the Milky Way. So, you know, the, wow. the amount of stars we can see with our eyes is 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 quite small compared to the uh, to what's actually out there. And I think we based on based on our observations, we understand there's probably about 100 billion stars in total in, in, in the Milky Way. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so obviously, with there being lots of stars, another question that came through was um, what are stars actually made of? Like a lot of times if I'm chatting with kids, they'll say, oh, it's a big ball of fire in the sky. Um, but it's actually a bit more complicated than that, isn't it? I suppose you could say it's a bit more complicated. But in, in another sense, it's, it's quite simple because most most of the material in the universe um, is, is hydrogen. It's a lot of hydrogen gas, um, a little bit of helium, and then very small bits of lots of all the other elements that you might be familiar with, periodic mm -hmm. oxygen, things like that. Um, but for the most part, stars are made up of, of hydrogen and helium. So that's that's basically it. Um, so they're just huge, huge balls of, of hydrogen and helium. Um, yeah. And it's not actually fire, really, is it? I mean, fire, as we know it, is something a bit different, but yeah. a star so you know, have fire. If you if you learned all about fire, uh, you might know that of course to have fire you you need you need oxygen and you need a source of, of, of air to sort of fuel the fire. But of course in space there there is no um, atmosphere, so you don't have that. So you've just got it's a ball of hydrogen and helium. What's happening is because there's so much of this material in one place, it it gets very very hot. Um, and what's happening is you've got nuclear reactions going on inside the star. And then out on the out on the surface, and all of that energy just gets transported out through the star. And then, because it's very hot, it's giving off a lot of energy, which which comes in the form of light, which is why it shines. Yeah. Not really fire, but it's 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 a reasonable, I suppose, simplistic description in in, in a sense, but it's not scientifically accurate, let's say. Yeah. Um. So we touched upon like multiple stars. Um. So the next another question that came in was someone wants to know what is a binary star. 
Well, that's that, that's very good. So a binary star. Um, so what we call a binary star is, is is a star. Well, it's actually two stars, which is is, is I suppose the, the the simple answer. So what we find is actually that from our observations, we sort of understand that probably most stars are actually in in in, in binary star systems. So where you've got two stars, and they're sort of they orbit around each other, much like how the Earth orbits around the Sun. But you can imagine you've got two stars in this system, so you've got two big stars orbiting around each other. Um, and a lot of stars are actually um, in these sorts of systems. And sometimes you can have even more exotic stars that have three or four stars in, in a system, and that gets quite mm -hmm. quite uh, extreme. But most we understand that most stars are actually uh, probably in binary star systems, um, which actually in, in one way makes our Sun a bit unusual because you could ask, well, our sun is, is a bit lonely. It doesn't have any companions, so mm. it's... Uh, it's all by its lonesome. <laughs> it, it didn't need a partner. <laughs> it's got us for company, right? Exactly, that's it. <laughs> um, so like, I get this question all the time whenever I'm talking with kids in the planetarium, um, and hopefully you'll be able to help me shed some light on this, but um, the question is, how big is the biggest star that we know of and the amount of times I've got that question this must be hundreds of times I mean you must hear questions like that all the time as well yeah that's that that is quite a, quite a good one and um, I suppose the, the the answer to that depends on what you what you mean by biggest because of course there are many different ways that we can measure a star we, we, one way we measure is is how massive it is how much material the star is made up of mm -hmm. And another would be how actually how is it physically big, as in what the size of the star is. So, that, and actually, sort of the answer sort of depends on which of those, um, which of those uh, criteria you, you use to define biggest. I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, to my knowledge, there is a lot of very massive stars. So, in terms of mass, so in terms of the amount of material in a star, there's a lot of very massive stars in what we call the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is something you can see in the Southern Hemisphere if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, and there are several clusters of stars, including one in the Tarantian and Nebula, which has the very, um, very uh, exciting name. I think the star cluster is called R136. Oh, so exciting. <laughs> like her exciting names. I mean, as we, we've already discussed, there are billions of stars, so you run out of exciting names fairly quickly. <laughs> yeah, not every star can be called Jeff. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Jeff's the star. <laughs> Um, but I think uh, so. There is a star in the R136 cluster, I think, which is about, uh, I think it's around 300 times the mass of the, the Sun. So it's 300 times more massive than our Sun is. Um, and wow. our Sun is, is, is um, 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. So if you've got a number 2 and you write 30 zeros after it, that's wow. how many kilograms of material is in the Sun. So multiply that by another 300, um, and that gives you an idea of how, how big these stars are. Wow, that's incredible. I mean, my usual go to is Beetlejuice. It's 900 times the size of the sun. But really, there is there's so much more to think of uh, when trying to define this. So like, that's why people always ask the questions because they just don't understand. And I think I know now a wee bit more from your explanation, which is good. Um, now, a thing that people are sort of thinking about now is the likes of space weather. And a question that came through was, um, do stars create space weather? Well, that's 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 quite a good question as well. Um, so, to start off, I suppose we, we we know understand the sun very well because obviously it's a star and it's quite close by, even if we can't see it um, most of the time when it's cloudy. <laughs> some places in the world are a bit uh, more fortunate, so we can obviously study the sun in, in great detail. Um, and from that, we know that the the outer layers of the sun there's an awful lot of of material. That is just getting flung out into space from the surface of the star because it's a very uh, dynamic environment. Um, and what can happen is all of this material that, get, that gets thrown out from the sun can move out through the solar system and interact when it gets near the planets, such as the, the Earth. Um, and one of the ways that we see that that, that can can manifest itself, and we can see these effects uh, quite directly, is through things like the the Northern Lights, which you, you may be familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, the fabulous displays of lights you see in the sky, which has got to do with all of this very energetic material moving from the sun, interacting with the magnetic field of the Earth, and then it gets funneled down towards the poles of the, the Earth, and you, you see these um, fabulous light displays when it interacts with the material in our atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
it ha happens in the sun, and for most as most aspects of 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 how of stellar physics, the sun is a pretty good example of of what a star is. It's it's fairly typical in a lot of its aspects. Some aspects less so than others, um, but we understand that a lot of other stars also do this have these sorts of behaviors because all all these stars are, are quite similar. They're all made up of hydrogen and helium. So. Mm -hmm. But their surfaces then are, are are spewing out this material, so it can obviously it's sending material out into the space around it, which can, um, if there are planets there, or even if there are not planets there, we can often see it because the most massive stars or the most the brightest stars th are throwing out material all of the time, and we can sometimes see these in it, in in these fantastic things like nebulae and stuff. Some of the nebulae we see are are literally the outer layers of stars that are being flung out. And then the, the light from the star, the, the light from the star that's left is still shining on, on the material we see around the outside and it produces these fantastic nebulae that we can see. Mm. That's incredible. And so um, another question I get again quite frequently in my line of work is uh, how do stars die? Because everyone's kind of obsessed with is the sun going to die, which, I, you know, it is going to go into its next stage at some point, but you know, so how do stars die? Right, well, the, the answer to that one, I suppose, again, I, I, I hate to use the phrase all of the time, but it, it, it it's not always a simple answer, so it depends. It's <laughs> a theme here, um, because it depends on, on how massive the star is, how, how exactly it dies, but the, the general process that the star will go through, as we said, it's mostly made up of hydrogen and helium. And how it sustains it, its its life and how it, it produces the energy is, is it's turning all of this hydrogen in the center of the star into helium. Um, but eventually, of course, you're going to run out of this hydrogen in the center of your star. So all of a sudden you don't you're not producing this energy to sustain, support yourself against the, the forces of gravity that are acting in because there's so much mass in the system. Um, and then depending on the mass of the star, if you're massive enough, you might actually get hot enough that you can start turning helium into heavier elements. You can make he turn helium into carbon and oxygen and things like that. And if you're even more massive, again, you can turn things into like carbon and oxygen into heavier elements and you fill out the whole periodic table um, with some interesting exceptions. Um, but basically, so it depends on the mass of the star, how far up this chain you can, you can go while still producing energy uh, to keep the star alive. But eventually, whether it's it runs out of hydrogen or it runs out of uh, carbon and oxygen or whatever stage when it can no longer produce energy. If it's a low mass star, so it's a star like the sun, it will it will sort of just run out of fuel. So it will be, then start to contract because gravity is the only sort of it's got gravity still acting inwards because it's it's a it's a massive object. Um, so it will just end up contracting and cooling down and it becomes what we call a white dwarf. So it's a star mm -hmm. that not producing any energy through nuclear reactions. It's just a very hot ball of gas um, and it's radiating out all of this energy and cooling down, which takes an incredibly long time. Mm -hmm. it's a massive star, so something typically I think we, th we take stars that are anything up to eight, eight times the mass of the sun and larger. These stars have slightly more mm -hmm. explosive endings in, in that they can, when they run out of fuel, what happens is they the core of the star is no longer producing energy, so the star starts to contract due to gravity. Mm -hmm. um, what happens actually is the core of the star reaches a point where it can't actually contract any further. It gets compressed in and it's, it's, it's reached its limit of how, how compressed it can get. Mm -hmm. uh, the outer material, as it's falling inwards, reaches reaches this. It's, it's, it's like this sort of the question. It it's reaches an immovable object, so to speak. And um, so this material has nowhere to go other than to sort of bounce back out and it produces a huge explosion. Uh, which we call a supernova, um, and that's generally what happens in, in a more massive star. It's a slightly more dramatic event, um, and then depending on what happens precisely on the details of what happens in the center, you'll either produce a neutron star, which is made up of, well, basically just neutrons because it's been squashed in so tightly together, or if, if it actually gets sort of compressed even further, you end up forming a, a black hole. Uh, mm -hmm. so they're sort of the three typical end states of a, of a star and they depend on, on the mass of the star was to begin with. Yeah, um, so you mentioned the term supernova there. Um, so actually a question that came through was um, what is a nova? So there's a difference between supernova and nova or you know what, what categorizes a nova and then what categorizes a supernova? Right, well I, I suppose that 
to, to go back there, we sort of need to understand the, the history of that in a sense. The word nova, obviously, coming, I think, originally from the Latin, it just simply means something that's new. So what was happening is the, the astronomers in, in slightly earlier times were looking at the stars in the sky. They knew where all the stars were, but every so often they'd find this new star that appeared out of nowhere. Um, and oftentimes that may have been a supernova explosion, so we know that that's the death of a very massive star. But there are other types of, of, of occasions where a star might suddenly get very bright and we can see it and we go, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So t I think typically when we call something, so we call this a supernova because it's it's very bright um, and it's a new thing. But if it's just a nova, it's something that sort of rapidly brightens, but not in a dramatic way like a supernova. And what often happens here, so we can go back to our discussion about binary stars. If you've got two, mm -hmm. you're quite close together. If they're very close together, what you find is actually you, you can reach a situation where the gravity of one star will be for material on the surface of the other star, the material on the surface of the second star might reach a point where it's actually more gravitationally attracted to the, the other star, mm -hmm. transferring material from one star to the other. And if you do this, what happens is you get this buildup of extra material falling off the surface of the star. Typically, in, in the case that produces an over, this might be a white dwarf star. So that's, this is a star that's sitting around and doing pretty much nothing at this point. Mm -hmm. And then what's, what's going to happen is this material is going to build up on the surface of the star. And eventually there's enough material, there's enough heat that it can produce, suddenly start to um, re, re, restart some nuclear reactions for a short period of time. And that means it flashes up and get, gets quite bright for, for a short period of time. And then you sort of get this rep re repeating cycle where you will get material gets transferred to the white dwarf. Eventually it will reach, it will get hot enough and it, pr it produces nuclear reactions and you get this brightening. Um, so what we can see is, is often these, these novas are sort of recur in a relatively regular type pattern. But um, so that's definitely one of the most, I think, common ways that you might produce something that we might call a, a nova. Mm. Um, so do you think, now this is just totally off the top of my head, do you think we're likely to see a nova anytime soon, you know, or like we don't we don't actually know when stars are going to do these things, so it's kind of just random, isn't it? It's okay. some I mean, we understand, um, I mean, a, a, a typical nova type, type thing are sort of, in, in one sense, are happening all the time, but they're not mm. necessarily bright enough that you might see them with your naked eye. We can see them with, with telescopes, and we've got a lot of telescopes. Spend the time surveying the sky every night and looking and comparing one night to another night to see what's changing, and they can pick up these things fairly fairly regularly. Um, so sort of the, the things that we're more likely to see as a, as a naked eye object in the night sky is something like a supernova. Um, and actually, based on, on the statistics and how, how often we expect them based on the population of stars in our, our Milky Way, um, and, and how often we sort of knowing roughly the lifetime of stars, we do sort of estimate that we're probably overdue a, a supernova explosion in, in our uh, mm. way. Um, but it's, it's, it is still somewhat, it, it, it is somewhat random and saying overdue. It, could, it, it should happen soon, but that is any time in the next couple of hundred years or maybe even a thousand years. So, you know, Time scales in astronomy are quite long, so when we say something yeah. happening soon, it doesn't mean it's happening <laughs> tomorrow or next week. It's yeah, it's more like, hey, this is going to happen soon in like two thousand years time. Exactly. <laughs> um. So, what? Um. Another question that came through to us is, you know, people are looking at, you know, what stars are closer to us, um, and the most common question was, what is the closest star to us other than the sun? Um, and then to jump on another question to that is how long would it take to actually travel to that star? Right, um, so the, the closest star to us, at, at least at this point in, in time, is, is, is a star called uh, Proxima Centauri, which is which is a rather appropriate name because the word Proxima coming again from, from Latin, which is mathematical languages in astronomy. <laughs> it means a, a near star. Mm -hmm. Is from Latin. <laughs> you just had to think about that there. <laughs> no, um, but but that's not the important part. Um, so Proxima Centauri is, I think, it's about four point two or four point three light years away. Yeah, which is is, is a di unit of measurement we use in astronomy to measure because space is is so large um, and we we use the speed of light to to to, to help us in in measuring long distances. 
Um, so that's how close the, the closest star is. In terms of how long it would take to travel to it, well, one answer that I've sort of just said there, it takes light 4.2, 4.3 years to travel from the Sun to Proxima Centauri. So if we could travel at the speed of light, obviously it would take about four years. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, the fastest spacecraft that we've, we've, the fastest speeds any of our spacecraft have managed to reach is nowhere near the speed of light. It, it, it's no. <laughs> in comparison, it's thousands of kilometers an hour, but that's still nowhere near the speed yeah. of light. So um, I, I can't quite do the maths off the top of my head, but I'm trying to think about this. But I think if we send a spacecraft at any of the sort of speeds that we've so far achieved, to get to Proxima Centauri is going to take uh, it, it, at least, I think, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years. So yeah. they're quite far away. Yeah, uh, we're, we're not in Star Trek world just yet. You know, no light speed or warp speed or anything like that, sadly. But uh, but that's really interesting, the fact that it would take like four years at light speed to get to the next star to us. Um, so a question I just want to finish up with then, um, it's sort of going a little bit off the topic of stars, but it is really relevant. Um, another question that people wanted to know was, uh, do all stars have exoplanets? Right, well, I think, obviously this is not something we're ever going to be able to prove conclusively, because it means we'd have to look at every single star and check if it has exoplanets. Yeah. <laughs> built several telescopes, um, recently things like the Kepler Space Telescope, which spent several years looking at the same patch of sky mm -hmm. uh, all of the time and taking uh, photographs at regular intervals every couple of minutes, I think it was, or possibly even more frequently at certain times. Um, and that was staring at one small patch of sky in the constellation of Cygnus um, for, for that period of time. And its mission was to, to look for these sorts of stars uh, which may have exoplanets and the way it does that is if it looks at the star, if you've got a star, you've got a planet that's orbiting around it, if from our point of view, so if we're, from the way we're looking at it, if uh, it happens that the planet passes in front of the, the star from mm -hmm. our point of view, you will see that the, the star gets um, slightly fainter as the, as the planet moves across. Mm -hmm. uh, use this technique is called a transit technique to to identify whether you can see see uh, an exoplanet um, obviously that has a lot of limitations because we obviously need to um, we need it needs to be we need to get lucky that the star is the solar system or the stellar system I suppose the planetary system around this this star needs to be aligned so that we can see it from our point of view yeah. all of them are they are randomly orientated in space mm -hmm. so you will see it for all of them. There are other methods of also detecting exoplanets, um, but this is sort of the, the one that has been most commonly utilized in recent times. Um, mm -hmm. What we find is that a lot of stars that we look at do have exoplanets, um, and, and given our understanding, understanding of star formation, where a star forms from a massive cloud of hydrogen, helium, gas and dust, and all this material that might be floating around in the Milky Way, it, it's not unreasonable to think that at least most stars should form with planets around them because there will always be some leftover material sort of lying around from, from when, the, when the star forms and not necessarily all the material goes into making the star. Mm -hmm. Not, I don't think all st all stars having exoplanets is, 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 is not impossible, but it's perhaps we can say that most stars do have exoplanets, I think, with a reasonable degree of, of certainty. Uh, yeah. But uh, we, we can't, we're never going to find all of them because there's so many stars out there. Yeah, uh, my own little tidbit to add into that would be the first exoplanet was found in 1995. So like to give people out there an idea to my age, I was five. Um, and we've been finding exoplanets ever since. So um, I think to date it's over 4,200 or something. Now we're finding them, we are finding them as you say all the time. So I mean, there's lots out there, but as you say, it might be impossible to find every single exoplanet around every single star. Um, but Connor, thank you so much for joining us for this uh, Q&A session. Um, I appreciate that it's a bit weird times that we're in, but I think it's been really great um, being able to do this from our homes and getting to talk to people in their homes. Um, guys, thank you so much for joining us for Science at Home. Um, we might have Connor on later on in uh, the next coming months uh, for more question time. So thanks very much, Connor, for joining us and uh, have a great day, folks. <laughs>